Hi, it's Matt Bisogno here again, and welcome to the three-week challenge, part two. Week two, three-part challenge, uh, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, this is the second bit, and last time we uh, we looked at how to use race selection techniques to get down to a workable number of races on which to concentrate. And today, in the second part, we're going to look at shortlisting within a race. By shortlisting, I mean going from a full list of, of race runners to a shorter list of contenders. Um, and in order to do that, we need to eliminate the least likely winners. Now, please note, that doesn't mean they can't win or indeed that they won't win, because sometimes they do. And um, and that obviously undoes any good work that we do. But the 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 key message is that we we cannot we simply cannot back every winner and once we get past that ideal once we understand that we can't back every winner then we're in a place where we're dealing with uh probabilities and value propositions and we can use all the good tools within Gigi's gold or other places um <clears throat> to to that end so um the elimination process works around a number of elements if you're using Gigi's gold then um, we're going to look at any obvious throwouts on instant expert uh, horses with just a, a very poor profile against today's race and we'll talk about that in a second um, I'm going to throw out anything that's priced 25 to 1 or bigger and um, again I appreciate that some people might be um, twitching uncomfortably in their chairs at that statement well we'll discuss that momentarily as well um, I'm going to look at trainer form as part of the consideration and I'm generally going to be quite harsh with horses that have got uh, less than a 10% win record um, because the races that we're looking at mostly are exposed form handicaps um, and uh, <clears throat> you know horses really Horses that I want to bet um, have a slightly better winning habit than than that. Um, once we've done that, we'll still have probably quite often quite quite a long short list. Um, so we still need to go a little bit uh, more deeply into things like the pace, individual horse form, um, report angles, and various other elements that we'll um, that we'll touch on in a second. Um, Importantly, the depth that you that, that that you delve into this, how much time you spend on this, depends on how much time you've got and how much experience you've got, um, and how much or little you enjoy the form study process. Um, I'm assuming that if you're watching this, you do quite enjoy that process, and you've got at least a little bit of time. And so, I'm going to um, I'm not going to shortcut this particularly. I, I mean, I, I will show you. The things that you can do let's say in five minutes but um i would encourage you if you're serious about this to to spend a degree more time looking at these elements on uh, a very short list of races that you've already done in stage one so you may only have a couple of races to look at and in this video we'll look at a couple of races for different reasons um but before we do all of that I want to return to the key theme of this three-part challenge which is the price is wrong and I want to illustrate the amount by which we have to beat the starting price to show a profit so I've got a, an Excel spreadsheet here and it's actually an export from query tool of the last five years UK racing um, uh, runs and wins by odds uh, so what there's nearly half a million runs in here and about 47,000 uh, wins um, so there's there's quite a considerable amount of data in this little table and what I've done is I, I've I've separated out each odds bracket uh, into their implied win percentage which is the first sort of beigey orange column and their actual win percentage which is the second beigey orange column column G um, and a 
done some differential calculations there. Now let me explain what I mean here. So um, let's use the odds of evens one to one because that's a nice simple one to use. Um, <clears throat> we can see that the implied win percent of, of an even money chance is 50%. That is to say the true, the, the, the in a coin toss, each side of the coin uh, has an even money chance, a 50% chance. Um, on the basis of 1,540 <coughs> actual runs, of which 675 of them were winning runs, the actual win percentage was a shade under 44%. Um, and so the point here is that the odds the bookmakers offer are not the true odds that a horse has of winning. They're not. They, they don't represent the true chance because, of course, bookmakers have to factor in their profit margin, and they do that at every price point. Um, the two columns to the right, column H, actual versus implied, shows the um, the percentage difference, I guess, between the actual and implied win percentages. So if we go up to one to two. Um, and I, I've removed all the uh, the shorter prices and one to two because they were smaller sample sizes. Um, if we go up to this one to two, we can see that the implied win percent is uh, sixty seven percent, and the actual win percent, two hundred and sixty one wins from four hundred and fourteen runs, was sixty three percent. So one to two chances win ninety four and a half percent as often as we might expect them to win. Um, as the implied win percent and by the same token <clears throat> in the last five years even money chances have won only uh, 87 percent as often as um, we might have expected them to win so now what you can see in this column h probably is that there's the numbers sort of jump around a little bit um, particularly actually this even money uh, figure which which is a kind of an an outlier by the look of it so what i've done is i've i've put this ivad3 um column i don't don't worry about the uh, catchy title essentially what it's doing is it's averaging uh the 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 actual the the odds in that column with its nearest neighbors so for instance if we look at um even money the average of 10 to 11 evens and 11 to 10 we can see down here hopefully is 91.57 and that's the number in here so that just kind of smooths the curve a little bit um, if we go down to slightly bigger numbers so we can see here we've got two to one which has a 33 percent implied win chance um, and on a much bigger sample size than the even monies <clears throat> we can see that the actual win percent was was nearly 31 percent so it's not not a huge disparity there actually and that um so two to one chances of winning 92 percent as often as we would expect them to win um and with with their immediate um neighbors it, it goes up slightly more to 90 nearly 93 percent um as often so what that means is that at these price points we've kind of got to we've got to beat an sp of two to one by about 8% um, to make a profit. And if we look at the actual win percentages here, we can see that 13 to 8 is 36%, 7 to 4 is 34%, 15 to 8 is 34%. So the implied win of 33% for a 2 to 1, if we, if we can get 2 to 1 about a horse that goes off even... 15 to 8 or 7 to 4 we have given ourselves a chance over time to make a small profit because the act the sorry the implied win of a 2 to 1 chance is less than the actual win of a 7 to 4 chance um it's quite it's quite difficult to explain this but basically if the price you take if if the implied win percentage of the price you take is less than the actual win percentage of the price the horse goes off then you've you've done enough if you can consistently do that then you've done enough 
to make a small profit over time. So in this example, if you can consistently get two to one, about seven to four chances, you will win. The, the maths are incontrovertible. Um, what I want to show you also is that the further away from kind of the sharp end of the market you go, uh, the, the more difficult it gets to 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 beat to beat the book essentially. So if we look at nine to one horses with an implied win percent of of ten percent, they actually win at slightly less than eight percent. Um and you've got to to in order to get a ten percent actual win, you've got to get up to about fifteen to two or seven to one. So if you're backing at nine to one, you've got those horses have got to shorten a couple of points to SP consistently for you to just chisel out slightly better than break even. Um, and the further down you go, here's a 25 to one. The true odds of this are just shy of 4%. Um, you've got to be getting up to about 18 or 16 to one about your 25 to one chances to make a profit. Uh, and then down at the 100 to one mark with an implied win percent of about 1%, they are actually winning at about a quarter of a percent. So 100 to 1s are winning at approximately 1 in 400. Um, and you've got to get up to probably 40 to 1. Your 100 to 1 shots have got to win, uh, have got to be sent off consistently around about 40 to 1 in order for you to beat the, um, the percentages. And even if you can do that, um, it's going to be a very long time between drinks um i mean you you know you'd have to have just a titanium um approach to to uh losing runs and an almost bottomless betting bank so this is why i say sort of 25 to 1 down i'm kind of you know arbitrarily ignoring those i could have put that cut off point anywhere really um sort of from 18 to 1 down but 25 to 1 i think gives us the wriggle room in order to exercise discretion with um, form considerations so just before we finish with these numbers the, 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 these numbers are important because essentially this is the whole um, the whole premise of what we're trying to achieve here is to find horses that are incorrectly priced earlier in the day to consistently do that and if we can consistently do that then we have we give ourselves the best chance of making a profit <clears throat> simply due to the disparity in price from when we took the price to the starting price um, okay so th this table just quickly is um, um, the axis along the bottom naught to 50 something these are the odds um, and ignore the naught 10 20 30 basically this is the zero the number one here is one to two and number 53 is 100 to 1. So these are short odds to long odds, left to right. Um, and this uh, up and down axis is um, probability. The, sorry, the, the disparity between the odds taken and the actual chance of it winning. And what we can see is at the shorter odds, the numbers are actually quite close to the 100% line, um, which would mean that the true, the implied odds and the true odds were the same. Note that they never actually get to 100%. The bookies are a bit too smart for that. And um, so there's always a margin in the in the starting price. But look also at how as we get away from the shorter prices, the gap between 100% and the actual um, win percent uh, diminishes. The gap gets larger. And when we get to these bigger prices, you can see it kind of almost falls off a cliff here. Um, so really we kind of want to be focusing most of our attention in this area the first sort of two and a half squares across up to about 25 um, odds line which is about 130 in actual fact and after that it gets more difficult now i'm not going to be as draconian as that in this exercise but just know that the further away from the top of the market you get um, the greater the disparity between implied and actual win in the superset 
in the, in other words, in in you know in in the whole in the whole range of even money chances or four to six chances or whatever it is. Okay, that is enough, probably more than enough on the maths, but this is the fundamental reason why we're doing this because we're trying to get, um, we're trying to back even money shots at five to four uh, consistently or whatever it is, you know, four to one shots at five to one. Um, we're trying to get a better price. We're trying to identify those horses that are incorrectly priced and therefore offer value. The price is wrong. So with that said, let's go and have a look at a couple of races today. And you can see here that I've used my uh, shortlisting approach, uh, simply selecting handicaps and eight to 10 runners to get from however many races there were today. Um, five times two, four, six, seven, about 40 races today, 39, I think. And I've got down to a much, much more manageable number of two, four, six, eight. And from those eight, I'm going to look at the three o'clock at Leicester, which is a handicap chase over two and three quarter miles. And I'm going to look at the six o'clock at Kempton, which is a six furlong sprint handicap. So we're going to look at the, the Leicester race first. And we can see here that um, the going is good. It's actually good to firm in places. Uh, and we've got nine runners and we can see that they're all pretty much, um, they've run plenty of time. So there's loads of form in the book and they're nice and exposed. Now, if you remember, we were going to look at, um, we're going to discard anything 25 to one plus in this race. Uh, there actually isn't anything that's, 25 to 1 plus in fact it's a very competitive handicap um, probably more competitive than I would normally look at but I think it's a good example race um, not necessarily in a positive way I, I should add uh, for this for this particular video um, so we're then going to look at horses with less than a 10% win record and any obvious chuckouts on instant expert so let's have a look at instant expert first and we can see here that um, this is looking at the last two years. I'm going to put it on all form. We'll have a look at all form. Um, and I think we'll have a look at all national hunt as well. So we've got quite a lot of form to go at. Um, what we've also got uh, is <clears throat> quite a lot that are not really proven on the ground. Now, what, what I think I am going to do is I'm going to put this on the place... Uh, view to give them a bit more of a chance and the first thing that I notice is that station master um, who's plummeting down the handicap is um, I mean he's just his form is is really not anywhere near where it was in the past now he is down in class today from these but he's got a one from seven place record on the ground and I'm trying to be forgiving here but I can't so I'm I'm actually going to eliminate station master uh, well smitten likewise has a a really um, poor record on fast ground and um, you know again like I'll, 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 I'll keep saying this throughout it w any of these horses can win this race but we've got to try and find a way to get the balance of probabilities in our favour and a horse like well smitten who is a um who, who doesn't look well favored to conditions i mean this is the place data and they're they're all red now these ones and twos i'd be very wary of but um he only placed three times out of 12 in um in uh class four races now they were win they were all three of them were wins but on much softer ground in most cases. And on today's going, he's naught from seven. And, and really, um, he, that's enough for me to get rid of him. So, <coughs> Will Smitten, who incidentally has been um, quite well backed today. You can see here, he's, he, 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 has been, he has taken quite a lot of interest. He's not for me um, on the basis of that, that going concern. So that's two out. Um, 
Poker School is another one that, if we look at his more recent form um, in chase races, he's it's um, he he just he doesn't really win. <laughs> he's had lots of chances. He's run close a few times, and you know one of these days he will fall in. But the last couple last couple of goes on this sort of ground, he's been beaten far enough. Um, he's starting to look well handicapped. Uh, but sometimes they look that way just because their the, their form is is not great at the moment. So poker school is one where I think I want to be against him. You can see he's dropped down from 123 quite slowly actually to 117. He's a 10 year old now, um, certainly not going to be improving, and um, I think I want to be against him as well. And we're, now we're starting to get down to a more manageable size. So from nine, we're down to six. Um, there's a couple of others that I'm not I'm not a fan of. Now, Bought Before Lunch has been really well back today. He might be the, the the best backed horse in the race so far at the time of at the time of recording this. But this horse is a serial loser. Um, he's won one of twenty career starts. Third, second, 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 third, second, fell, third, eighth, second. I mean, this horse is expensive to follow. And, you know, again, like he, he he's running close in some of these races, but for whatever reason, be it misfortune or um, lily liveredness, he's not getting it done. And um, these are definitely the ones I want to be against. So he's got a 5% win record in 20 runs um even if he won today he'd have a nine point something percent win record so <clears throat> he's just um again you know he, he can win but he's a four to one chance and he hates winning <laughs> ostensibly at least so he's the sort of horse that i you know at the top end of the market i'd always want to be against a horse like that the other thing to say is that his trainer um paul weber i mean you wouldn't you know, like recently, his his place rate is is decent, twenty eight and forty three percent on a small number of runners. But his one year form, four wins from ninety six, four um, percent. Again, you know, this is this is not somebody who uh, is very nice chap, I'm sure, and and probably a, a decent trainer who hasn't got great ammunition to go at. But these are the ones I want to be against. So he's. Um, even though he's down in class, he is an X for me. Um, another one that has a similar kind of a profile is Bandsman. Now, he has won a few more, but not for a good while. Uh, he did win about a year and a half ago, but that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven starts back. Um, he hasn't really dropped down the handicap a huge amount since then. And I just, um, I wonder if he, he's had a lot of racing and I just wonder if he, if he still has quite the same affection for it. Um, on back class, he'd have a bit of a chance, but if we put this on the last two years, you can see he's one from 16 and, um, yeah, I mean, on the going, you might, you know, he's kind of, slightly more interesting um is that last time he had a heavy fall last time no he's run since then um i just i mean he he could win and he'd be one that i'd be slightly more apprehensive about um about discarding but nevertheless i am discarding bandsman um i think the trip is not um probably not ideal either so i i'm cautiously going to discard bandsman now this is basically my shortlist now i've got um i've got four horses in the race that i'm actually interested in potentially uh betting the first of them is um cage of fear as you see he's got a report angle here for um, a front running jockey but i don't think he's going to be a, a front runner today I think station looks like station master will go forward. <coughs> Cage of fear will be ridden more um, cagely, maybe. 
Uh, you can see that this is his grade. He's finished second and first in this grade. You can see that the ground on those occasions was this sort of ground market race, and it was this sort of trip. Um, he carried 11.7 in those races, so not a million miles from today's 11.8. In fact, very close. Uh, he handles the ground we know. He's got top weight in here, and you know that's kind of earned. Um, I think he's an interesting runner. The, the market disagrees with me. Um, he's not. He he's not been backed at all yet. Um, but I do. Um, two starts back, he ran really well, and then he went up seven for that. He's only he he's only down one since then. Uh, he's taken a slight drop back in trip, which is interesting. Maybe didn't quite get home at Carlisle in a better class race. That was a class three. He's back in class four today. I think. Uh, at around seven to one, I definitely want Cage of Fear on my team anyway. Um, the next one is Big Difference, and he is the favourite. Um, what didn't I like about him? Yeah, okay. So let's have a let's have a look at Big Difference. He's not had many goes. In fact, he's only had five goes, and he's won one, and he was placed on another occasion. Uh, that was a handicap hurdle he won. Um, hang on a minute. There we go. He's had a few more goes than that. He's had nine goes, um, five in the last two years. Uh, so he got his handicap mark 109. Second time in a handicap he won of 106. Went up to 113 um, where he ran. Well, he finished third, but he was beaten 70 lengths. Um, then this year... Fourth at Ludlow, pulled up a banger over a trip that might have been too far, three miles six, back to two miles seven at Taunton, where he nearly won, stayed on at the last. Um, he's dropping back a little bit, well, probably about the same trip in fairness as Taunton, um, and he wasn't beaten very far that last day. That was on very fast ground as well, which you'll encounter here so um he he has got a fair form chance but one of the things that i noticed about this was that this last race he ran off 108 and even though he got beaten he's running off 114 today so he's actually gone up six pounds in the handicap for getting beaten um and that's obviously not not going to make his life any easier. Now, of course, he can win, and um, he's definitely a danger and potentially a saver. So when we come to talk about um, bet selection in part three of this three-part series, he'd be a horse that we that I would potentially be looking to um, to kind of get my stakes back on horses that I backed elsewhere in the race. Um, Seven to two, I can let him beat me just because I think even though he's kind of unexposed, um, he he didn't really deserve to go up six for getting beat last time, um, even though there was presumably a fair, fair distance back to the rest of them that day. 14 back to the third. Um, I mean, only five of 11 <clears throat> finished and it's entirely possible that a number of the beaten horses didn't handle the ground to to one degree or another so i wouldn't um i think that's quite a literal interpretation of that form um which which makes him certainly not well handicapped if not probably poorly handicapped either now oscar wilde is an interesting one he's taken plenty of money um this morning and again he's not really for me um one over a shorter trip um he the the key thing with Oscar Wilde I think is the trainer form uh, Sue Smith uh naught from 31 in the last month and although she's naught from 10 in the last fortnight four of them have placed um so they're getting closer but um I just it's not it's not a good record and um this chap his his form is all on soft ground soft and heavy ground um that doesn't mean he won't act on 
on this faster ground but he's never tried it <coughs> so as far as i can see anyway let's have a, a deeper dive um he ran on good ground here and he was beaten far enough ran on good soft here beaten 13 by a good horse uh beaten seven as the even money favorite in this novice hurdle beaten 26 in a handicap here on good to soft and this is faster ground so um his winning form is on soft um it's not an obvious positive that he's running on good good to firm here and um although i can see i can kind of see why they've backed him i don't want to back him um he's not for me uh certainly the trainer i know you know she might be turning a corner looking at these places in the last two weeks but um it's a big red 14 and 30 and there's not there's not a huge amount of um uh mitigating circumstances with this chap so i will let him beat me too i'm just going to do that and that and that leaves me with waikiki waves now waikiki waves you can see has got pretty much a line of green here um if I put it on all and all codes, um, see so yeah, that's not helpful. All national hunt. We can see that he's got he's got a pretty solid record against conditions, particularly win record. Um, he won his only trip here over two and a half about eighteen months ago. That was off uh, ninety eight. He's he's a good bit higher up the handicap now, um, but he's won four out of seven in this grade. Uh, Fontwell looks a favourite haunt, but as we know, he has one here. And um, I mean, one of the things I really like about this guy, which I mentioned previously, is that he wins races. And, um, you know, I kind of prefer a binary horse, a horse that's sort of naught, 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 one, 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 to a horse that's two, three, two, three, two, three. Because those guys, you know, we've got one in this field. They're, they're, they're um, bought before lunch is the one in this field. They're, they're they can be very expensive to follow and um so the one i want to be with here now he you can see that he racked up a sequence um last spring and into <coughs> um the autumn last year and then he went from a mark of 95 um all the way up to 122 he's just coming back down to 113 here he won the last of his one two three four five races in quick succession off 112 so he's sort of knocking on the door um last time he was never really in it at font well i was there that day and he just he, he, he finished quite well you can see it says nearest finish there um this is quicker ground but i i, I just think he'll be a bit a bit tighter for this third run off the layoff and um with the course form as well i i yeah he's 10 to 1 and um you know like i think he's he probably has a better chance than 10 to 1 chance and i'm prepared to bet that as well so these are my two against the field here um by a process of elimination i want to be with cage of fear and waikiki waves now the reason i said that this wasn't <clears throat> wasn't an ideal race to showcase is because if we look at the market uh for this race we can see that waikiki has not really been backed and cage of fear has not been backed at all um the horses that have been backed are well smitten uh which might be a non-stayer that was the other thing i had against him um let's just have a quick look at well smitten if we look at his wins and places this is a two mile seven this is a 23 furlong race and we can see that his wins and places are all over shorter. Um, now that doesn't mean he won't stay if he's never tried it, but he has. He has tried it. He's he's run um, twenty four furlongs here, fourth of five, twenty three furlongs, unseated when he was ten lengths third, um, twenty three furlongs beaten eighty four lengths, dropped back in trip and he's a winner. And, um, you know, his winning form is at shorter. So I just doubt whether he'll quite stay, although I very much respect the trainer, um, a really good trainer, Sam England. So that was me against Well Smitten. Um, Oscar Wilde, we talked about that one. And Bought Before Lunch, we talked about that one as well. Um, so, 
you know, kind of where in an ideal world where I want to end up having done this analysis is I want the horse, the horses that I've identified as interesting to be showing up in the blue rows on odds checker. In other words, that, you know, my my value radar is kind of on the right track um, in this race so far, at least. And, you know, the starting price market is not the market at 11.45 for a three o'clock race. Um, so far, at least, the market disagrees with me and that may make me right or wrong in the short term, but over time it will make me wrong um, if starting prices reflect this market here. But we'll have to see on that. So I'm backing um, Cage of Fear at 7-1 to one and Waikiki Waves at 10-1. to one. Uh, and I'm probably with best odds guaranteed, and we'll just see we'll see how they go against the market. The other race I want to look at is the six o'clock at Kempton, which is a six furlong sprint handicap. So let's pull that race up, and we can see here that we've got a um, nice ten runner field. We've got a couple of three year olds in here at the top and bottom of the handicap. Uh, one of them is a first time handicap, first time, which is interesting. Um, the first thing that I want to look at here is the pace uh, because I know that Kempton's uh, sprint track is a pace biased track and we can see that those that led have got a much better record than those that were held up. Um, we've got a couple of big prices here as well which we can immediately eliminate. A couple of those are hold up horses as well so that's sort of a double knock against those. Um, so let's just let's get rid of the the biggies. Uh, so that is I'm going to get rid of sort by odds here. I'm going to get rid of deputize. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the cruising lord. I'm going to leave those ones in there for now. Count Otto was the um, was the back marker pace wise here. So I'm going to I, I think he's got quite a lot to overcome um, in. Like if if there was loads of early pace here projected, then I might be a bit more forgiving of these back markers. But it, it looks like it's going to be a fairly um, evenly run contest. Maybe um, Frozen Ocean might go forward on his own, but it does. It's not overloaded with pace anyway, so it kind of plays against the hold up horses, I think. So I'm going to get rid of Count Otto. So now we're down to seven, but we haven't really made many inroads into the market percentages um, let's go to instant expert next and we can see that we've got a couple of horses with no equivalent form no um, relevant form against today's profile now one of them is a handicap debutant and this is I've set it up with handicap so that's why um, frozen ocean shows that way Jonah Jones I'm not too sure about that one let's have a look at him Okay, so he's been running on turf um, and I think potentially has not yet run on the all weather. And that is affirmative. So we can see his all weather record is naught, naught, naught. Um, so it's interesting that he is a five to two favorite, uh, having never run on the all weather. Um, now, you know, Kempton isn't, isn't Southern and it. It won't necessarily stop him from winning the fact that he's not run on it before. But but it is an unknown and um, all unknowns need to be factored into the price. Um, other things that need to be factored into Jonah Jones's price is that uh, he's been running in. He's been running very creditably in much bigger fields and all of these races are on straight tracks. Doncaster, Ascot, York, York, Ascot, Haydock. So. This is a turning six. Um, the fact that he's been running well in five furlong straight track handicaps in big fields uh, might might be interesting stepping up to six here. But um, for all that he's been running well, he has been getting beaten. And, and, and again, the kind of the nature of the races he's been running in there are very different or is very different to the race that he's presented with today. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look and see if he's got any uh, he's never run right handed before so that's another thing um, he 
general configuration. Yeah, I mean, he's just he's being asked to do a lot of things differently today. He clearly is a talented horse. Uh, I mean, he's beat, beaten most of the horses he's run against in these very big fields. But again, he hasn't got the most exciting win profile. Um, not one since October 2018, which is <clears throat> two years ago. And um, he's had three, six, nine goes since then. He's been knocking on the door and, you know, arguably he's feasibly handicapped. But he's no bargain at five to two, is he? Um, even dropping down in class. So I'm going to, of course he can win, but I'm I'm, I'm going to be against him at the price. Um, I make him a bigger price than that. So what have we got left on Instant Expert? We've got Typhoon 10, who has had four goes at uh, six furlongs without winning, but he has run, uh, he all but won over this course and distance and in this class a couple of months ago. Um, and he's off the same mark here, so you certainly couldn't discount his chance. Um, I'm, I, what I'm really looking for, I'm looking for the big, the, the red blocks with the bigger numbers to see if I can disqualify any of those. Let's have a look at Benny and the Jets. Um, he's been second here a couple of times, most recently in a higher class race, uh, up a pound for that. Um, he's another who is kind of knocking on the door without winning. Let's have a look at some of these, um, the broader form profiles. And we can see that Benny actually it wins races, particularly on the all weather. Um, so he's, uh, He's a very interesting character, and his place record is is you know really solid. Um, his record here at Kempton only been out of the frame once in seven starts, um, and that was in a a better race. He's he's definitely interesting. I I I couldn't I couldn't kick him out of the. Um, out of considerations, even though he does have that, you know, slightly um, questionable win rate at the track. He, he always seems to run well anyway. Uh, Melodic Charm hasn't done much of anything. Um, you certainly couldn't say didn't handle the track for a, a run over an extra furlong um, and only a single try at the track. So he's the other three-year-old in the race, I think. Um, trainer is in good recent form and has a good long-term form record. And um, Total Commitment is another one I like. Um, he is coming back to form. Uh, the, the run last time was over seven. Again, he's a six furlong horse, as we can see um, here, his record at six, second, 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 fourth, first, first, two of these over this course, albeit in lower class. So he's another one of interest. Lancelot du Lac. Um, is 10 now and you can see that he's dropped a mile since his last uh, winning run on the all weather he's 24 pounds below that um, and that's evidenced here you see his last win here was in November 2015 five years ago um, his more recent form hasn't really adver advertised his credentials for this uh, where are we Lancelot I just put that on all. all. There we go. And you can see that he's been, although he's dropping down the handicap, as we've said, he's um, he's been beaten far enough mostly. And at six furlongs, um, he's been beaten far enough for long enough for him to be overlooked by me at least today. So he's he's coming out. Now the other one of interest is Frozen Ocean, first time in a handicap. Um, he's only had four goes, so he's the least exposed of all of these. He runs for Saeed Bin Saror, who um, has a very good record at the track um, and in handicaps and first time in handicaps. Uh, not quite so good in sprint races, it should be said. Um, unusually for Saeed, he's naught from any number in the last two weeks so he hasn't had a winner for a while and in the last month he's been quiet as well um but i i, I do think his 
overall profile is quite interesting and eight to one was appealing to me particularly as um, he could very well lead in this field. He's drawn five, which is a good a good stall from which to try to make the pace. And as we can see from this green blob up here, um, leaders have got a credible chance to go all the way. So I, I, I certainly think he's um, uh, he might be a smidge of value in this race. The main problem I've got with this race, as you can see, is I have struggled to eliminate more than half of the field. And three of the five that I have eliminated, in fact, four of the five that I've eliminated, are priced 18 to 1 or more. Now, the other one that I've got rid of is the 5 to 2 favourite. And the, the, the reason for eliminating him was not really on form. It wasn't, it wasn't so much on what he'd done as on what he hadn't done. Um, in other words, he hasn't run on a turning track. He hasn't run um, on the all-weather uh, he's been getting beaten quite a lot. He hasn't won recently, although he's run very well. Um, and, you know, five to two, he's just too short with those question marks against him. Um, so I've ended up with five and the bet selection would be um, a key uh, a, key, a key consideration in a race like this. I am drawn to Frozen Ocean uh, purely because of the price and the pace angle uh, and the fact he's unexposed. So probably would back him. Um, total commitment, I think I'm waiting for him to drop in class. Melodic charm, interesting. Probably let him beat me. Benny, Benny and the Jets I respect as well. So I'd probably take Benny and Frozen in this race. But it's a very competitive handicap, as you can see. And quite difficult to um, to eliminate more than <laughs> more than the outsiders. Um, let's just check the market on this race finally to see if they agree or not. Uh, one of the challenges here is that one of the shorter priced runners is a non-runner. So um, we kind of see a bit more blue than we might otherwise see. But you can see that there's been um, some money for Frozen Ocean, although 10 to 1 is appealing and I have backed it. Um, total commitment I do like him but I, especially from one but I just it, it wouldn't surprise it it would actually quite annoy me if he won because I, I'm, I'm a fan of the horse um, but I think Lingfield and or a drop in class might be ideal for him Benny the Jets looks like he's sure to run his race again today likewise Typhoon 10 and I'm not I, I'm just not sure about Jonah Jones you can see he's kind of going out to 11 to 4 now I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if he ended up sort of seven to two or something by the time the race is off. Um, and this is the game. The game is to kind of guess which way the odds are going, which ones are the wrong price and back those. So my contention here is that um, Frozen may be the wrong price, Frozen Ocean, um, in a in a positive way, in a, in a I want to back it sort of way. And Jonah may be the wrong price in a negative way. Uh, not quite that I want to lay it, but I do think that it's, probably a bit on the short side based on the things it's got to do today that it hasn't done before. Uh, Typhoon and Benny are probably about where they should be. Uh, I'm, I find Melodic quite hard to peg. Um, total commitment again, you know, he he's a horse who probably is about the right price. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Um, as I say, the key purpose was to try to shortlist using a combination of um, uh, kind of uh, quick access shortlisting, throwing things out from Instant Expert, throwing out the longer prices, throwing out those that that don't like winning, um, and then drilling down a bit more <clears throat> in a in a slightly more considered way into the pace, um, a horse and trainer form, and anything that you might have in your report angles that advertises the chance of a horse, um, and to consider after that which ones the price might be wrong about about which ones the price might be wrong. Um, and this is what I would like you to try to do for the next week or so, is to, from your chosen shortlist of races, from the race selection part one, is to try to uh, deploy these concepts in your betting. Maybe just do it for one race a day. Don't necessarily bet the horses. All you really want to, 
all you really want to try to achieve is to see if the horse that you've identified goes off at a shorter price than you can back it um, and therefore whether you can kind of bridge that actual versus implied odds differential gap um, yeah that's enough for this one I think we're up to 50 minutes which is a bit longer than I was hoping for but quite a few important concepts in there and a couple of examples which may or may not pan out well I'll just put a very small addendum to this video later on um, with the results of those races good bad or ugly and um, and then it's going to be over to you all right this is Matt Bizonio saying thank you very much for watching this section so the results are in uh, and it was an interesting day um, probably a better day from a form reading perspective than a market reading perspective as you can see in the three o'clock race um, where I wanted to be with Waikiki Waves and Cage of Fear Waikiki won the race at 10 to 1 hooray uh, but he was 10 to 1 early Boo. so um, in terms of beating the market no dice Cage of Fear was a seven to one chance early and um, returned seven and a half to one. He made a number of jumping errors on the way around. Um, he's still a novice. I think he's only had three or four goes over fences, and um, I think he was eased off towards the finish. He wasn't. At, he was still in it, sort of two out, and um, just backed out a little bit uh, after those mistakes told. Um, you can see the fate of the other ones just a couple of things to point out the the favorite big difference who was eight pounds higher for having um or was it six pounds higher for having been beaten last time well he ran another very creditable race in defeat um <clears throat> and there's a reasonable chance he'll go up again for getting beat here uh, i hope he doesn't because that that does seem a little bit unfair but um such is the nature of handicapping the horse the, the other horse I wanted to point out was this bought before lunch you, you'll remember he was the horse with lots of twos and threes by his name cruised through the race traveled like the winner um, and then backed out of it as he has done on a number of occasions previously uh, he finished third in the end at seven to two he's a bit of a burglar to be honest um, and you know you need to be aware of these horses like I said I'd rather take a binary type like Waikiki than a 2323 type like bought before lunch any day of the week um, I've got the market wrong here I've got the form book right and um, I guess in the short term on any given day we want to get the form book right but longer term we we need to beat the market and that didn't happen in this race so that's that's um, a, a disappointing side effect of a quite pleasing result. Um, the other race, you can probably see in my bottom right hand corner, it's 20 past six as I'm recording this postscript. Um, the other race was the six o'clock race. And here I wanted to be with um, the Godolphin horse, Frozen Ocean, I think it was called. Um, he, as predicted, or as suspected he led he led at quite a brisk pace and um, uh, he was very very weak in the market so I thought he was I thought he was big at 10 to 1 um, and if it sort of if it looks like a duck if it looks too good to be true then sometimes it is and um, this was one of those cases he drifted all the way out to 16 to 1 in fact before returning 14s I wasn't beaten that far, I was beaten five lengths, having done plenty in the early part of the race. Um, it's hard really to know what the story is with him. He obviously doesn't do a lot at home, can't do a lot at home in, if he was that weak in the market. Um, <clears throat> and it might be that he's a slightly tame finisher. Uh, I wouldn't completely give up on him yet uh, for all that I'd, I'd kind of want to price about him next time as well. Anyway... Um, at the sharp end of the race you can see that sadly for me because I was waiting for him to drop in class total commitment just prevailed you can't see the distances they're not in yet but it was a nose and a head uh, very tight finish Benny came to win the race like he's in fairness he's another one who's a little bit like bought before lunch um, he wins occasionally uh, there we go that's very 
very convenient the full results just come in and you can see that the margins were ahead and a nose Benny came to win it and uh, just found one too good again he just comes with the one run and um, so another second on his scorecard Typhoon 10, 10 ran well and Jonah Jones who I thought was underpriced um, actually ran a really noteworthy race now as I say the, the one I liked did go hard in front but Jonah was right at the back on a track that really doesn't favour hold up horses at all and um, you know he's kind of he's one of those strong travellers that in, in these big field straight track races he can sort of cruise through at the one pace and keep going when others have done too much um, I think he probably without seeing the section it's hard to know but I think he probably did that here in the end you can't see this on here but he was only beaten uh, that far so there's the there's the photograph um, total commitment Benny came to win the race in the green and red here and then just backed out of it Typhoon 10 ran a really honest race this guy he was out here somewhere and, and closed fast another another quarter furlong certainly half furlong and he wins the race um, interesting one I'd probably want to be against him next time over six furlongs here because he got his setup they went fast where often they don't go full full tilt over six at Kempton so he, he'd he be one uh, you know be absolutely no surprise whatsoever if he won but um he might be put in again short last time the market seems to like these unlucky losers um and um <clears throat> you know a lot of them are unlucky for a reason because of their run style and he could be one of them anyway that was a slightly more verbose postscript than intended but um today wasn't a day for beating the market albeit that it was a day for finding a winner with the form book um, we need to try to do both long term and the form book is obviously the route to beating the market uh, so that I, I kind of take a, uh, a a Pyrrhic victory there I guess um, and um, I'll be trying to get better odds of, than, than the SP again tomorrow uh, that's your challenge please do embrace it if you would like I think it would definitely help your betting long term if you think in this way and um, that's all for this one. Be back with part three uh, next week. Okay. Thank you very much for watching.